Hello, welcome to another episode of Founder Exchange. We have an amazing guest today. I'm so honored to have him here, Paolo Parjanian, who is the founder of Embodied, a companionship and educational and, uh, and teaching robot for children. He also is uh, one of the most prominent roboticists in the world, uh, having previously served as the CTO of iRobot, uh, and uh, I think you have a PhD in robotics as well. Um, so yeah, welcome to the show. Great to have you here. Thank you, Bibo. It's my pleasure to be here. So tell me, uh, what was the first robot you ever built? Take me back. Oh man, it must have been during my master's, uh, study, master's of science studies in Denmark, Aalborg University, where my friend and I decided to build a robot to be able to navigate using computer vision from one room to the next, which sounds very trivial, but it turns out it's a very hard problem. Still, still today, many people are working on the problem of mapping and navigation, but that was uh, our first robot, and we could barely make the robot find the doorway, drive through the doorway, find its way to the next room, and then drive through the doorway to the next room. That was our master's, uh, study uh, thesis and, and project. Well, what year was that? Oh, man. So this was in, uh, let's see, 19, uh, 94. Wow. So uh, it was all computer vision or was it, it was camera based? Was it sensor based? Primarily it was camera based at the time. Uh, I mean, Navigation at the time didn't really exist at all. Right. But if anything, people would use sonar sensors for doing mapping and navigation using sort of time of flight and distance. Uh, we were one of the first to start using a camera based system, which at the time required a lot of computation. We had a huge computer rack on top of the robot. So we had to build right. a pretty big robot. Right. Uh, yeah. So that was, that was our first foray into robotics. Amazing. And you ended up, uh, did you found Evolution Robotics or did you join them? So Evolution has a bit of a long history. So I joined Evolution Robotics, I call it Evolution 1.0, when Idea Lab, Bill Gross of Idea Lab in Pasadena had started a startup company in his incubator. And I joined as a CTO. Uh, and then a few years after they decided that the company is not going anywhere, they decided to shut it down. Mm -hmm. I negotiated with Idea Lab to take the core assets that my team and I had developed, the core technologies, and spin it out into a new code, which carried the same name, but it was a new entity. Got it. And I was founder of that company in 2008. So I, oh, in two, that was in 2008. Okay. Um, I don't think a lot of people know what Idea Lab is. I know what it is. I think it'd be worth uh, describing uh, that company. Yeah, Idea Lab is probably one of the first incubator concepts uh, that was extremely su successful during the dot com boom. It was founded by Bill Gross, uh, who is a, he called himself not a serial entrepreneur, but a parallel entrepreneur, because that was the whole idea of Idea Lab was that he would be able to start many companies in parallel at a time during the dot com boom. Um, so a lot of uh, dot com companies you would know. Uh, from Cars Direct to eToys, uh, you name it, Wedding Channel. Uh, he also, Bill Gross's, uh, I guess, big claim uh, is that he invented the AdWords business model that he licensed or sold the whole idea to, to Google before Google was really Google. Uh, he founded GoTo.com, which was acquired by Yahoo and so on. And after the dot-com bust, he actually got into more deep tech companies, including solar, space exploration, and robotics. So when you founded Evolution, uh, what, was the, what was the idea? Where did you think the company was going to go? What was the so plan? So originally, Idea Lab uh, 1.0 that was started at Idea Lab, uh, the Evolution Robotics 1.0, um, Bill Gross's idea or vision was to become Microsoft of robotics. This is in 2001. So the idea was to develop the software platform that all companies could use to build robots. Um, and it was a way, way, way too early of an idea. Even today, you could argue that that's a too early of an idea. Right. 
but it was bold enough and my interest was to learn about entrepreneurship and Bill Gross as a very successful entrepreneur, I decided that I'm going to join them and learn from that experience. Uh, when we were there, uh, my team and I developed some breakthrough technologies. The uh, One of the first known uh, commercial implementation of Visual Slam, which is visual simultaneous localization mapping, allowing a robot using a camera and some dead reckoning sensors to map the environment to be able to navigate reliably, was invented at Evolution Robotics. Although the business was not working out, so when we shut down that business and I spun it out into a new core, we used that core technology to go uh, disrupt the robotic floor care industry, right? We had iRobot that had already proven that there is a massive market opportunity with robot vacuum cleaners. All the iRobots robots were uh, using very mundane, uh, random sort of pattern of navigation for right. coverage. So we decided to go build a system, systematic robot that needs to map the environment, know how to go from one room to the next and so on. And that's what we developed. So, and that's where the success came for us. We, we launched the first product called Mint, which was a hard, full, hard floor cleaner. And within the first 12 months, did about $25 million in sales and an iRobot acquired us. So I read that uh, iRobot paid 74 or 78 million, something like that for the company. Um, was, your, was your plan to try to compete with them outright and, and, um, and build market share? Or were you thinking at the time that, this, that there's some better ways of doing this, that if we had this in the right, um, in the hands of like a, a brand, the right brand or the right commercial, commercial operators that uh, you'd find a, a different, like a, you know, uh, more success. Um, we were planning to build out and, and we get, got out of gate really well, right? I mean, in, in one year, went going from zero to $25 million in Amazing. revenue is, is yeah. usually not common for startups. No. Um, the challenge we had though, this is in 2010, we launched a product 2011. I had to go raise money at the time. Um, if you think raising money for hardware or slash robotic startup is hard today, imagine what it was like 10 years ago. So I remember I was on Sand Hill Road and I would walk into one VC firm's office after the next. As, and as soon as I sat down, as, as soon as I said hardware and yeah. robot, the meeting was pretty much over. Yeah. Uh, the VCs in Silicon Valley or anywhere else were not really uh, excited about robotics at the time. Uh, and did not like the business model, nor did they understand it. So it was super hard to raise money. So I barely was able to put together a round of financing for uh, the company, which was a C, C round, uh, but it wasn't nearly enough to be able to go capture significant market share from iRobot. So when iRobot right. came, Colin Angle, the CEO and founder came to me and said, I wanna, I'm thinking about uh, sort of joining forces together and so on. I thought if I believe in a mission of what we have created, iRobot is the best platform with which we could expand market share, right? right. So that's how, that's why it was really merely a financing option. And the, iRobot's financing option was much more attractive than uh, the alternative. All right. And so when they bought the company, they made you CTO uh, what was the, what were the first couple of things that, that you did there as, as the CTO? Um, I would say the first couple of things I did was helping the company focus its strategy because iRobot at the time was doing robotic food care, was doing a hospital robot, telepresence robot for hospitals and was doing military robots. And in, I remember day one on the job, I was in Boston and Colin and I were having a conversation. He said, what are your early observations? I said, number one observation is that you've got to have a clear strategy and focus. And I don't see that. And we worked together to develop a strategy and decide what are the areas we got to make bets on and what are the areas where we got to divest. So that was one thing um, which helped the company focus and dominate the robotic floor care industry. iRobot this year is on a, a track to do $2 billion in revenues which is phenomenal. Um, the other thing was helping with uh, increasing the pace of innovation. Uh, iRobot comes from a 
much more mechanically focused engineering discipline, right. which inherently has much slower iteration cycles to it when you do tooling and production, all these things. And we help transform the company more towards a more software and agile. Now you have Roombas, all of the, a lot of iRobot products are now connected. And so they have an opportunity to do re regular software updates. Uh, they, they can collect a bunch of data in terms of usage to understand what is working, what is not working, which allows them to keep iterating and rapidly improving the product uh, functionality. And that required a completely different mindset. And iRobot has been very successful in going through that transition. Right. Or did iRobot have a, um, an R&D department where you guys were spinning up ideas for, for all kinds of other types of uh, devices that didn't make it to market? Yeah, iRobot did have a uh, advanced technologies group, uh, which was maybe at the time I became the CTO was about 70 to 80 people. And then they had an engineering department, which was several hundred engineers. Uh, and that's another thing I did in terms of increasing pace of innovation was finding the right way for connecting the R&D to actually the product, product team. Because there was a big gap. Uh, right. the, 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 the advanced technology group was developing a bunch of really cool and interesting technologies, but uh, the, the uh, probability of them making it to products was very low. The success rate was very low, and we wanted to increase that. So as a matter of fact, what we did is we said, you've got to pretty much be one team. We are connecting you to each other so that the technology makes its way to the product. And the technology from the day one gets informed by the needs of the market, both in terms of functionality, performance, reliability, but also cost. Mm -hmm. As an example, at Evolution, one of the things we did, we went and developed the mo world's most advanced, lowest cost visual navigation technology that used a three daughter processor and a couple of daughter camera and some glue logic to develop visual slam technology. Whereas the state of the art at the time was solutions that cost tens of thousands of dollars. And the reason we were able to do that is because we focused on the problem. We said, we, we said if you want to have consumer robots navigating in the house, you cannot add thousands, right. not even hundreds of dollars of cost to the bill of material right. cost. It has to be in the dollars to maybe $10, $20 cost. So that constraint uh, actually is super important because you may end up with a solution that is really not a solution. It's just a technology showcase. So that connection between the, the advanced technology group and product development group at iRobot allowed us to be able to integrate technologies into a product uh, pipeline much better. How, mu how many of uh, those technologies were sort of originating from a product marketing or, or a business uh, goal versus originating first as R&D and then being handed off to someone who could help turn it into something commercial? Originally, so in 2012, when I, when I became the CTO, it was, uh, it was majority of it was just driven by government funded R&D projects. DARPA and DOD and National, National Science Foundation and so on were funding research and development at iRobot to develop technologies from manipulation technology to sensor technologies and so on. So it was completely disconnected actually from the product roadmap and product uh, market. Uh, and that's exactly, again, in one of the early conversations I, I asked Colin, I said, once, once we have a clear strategy, then we can know what technologies we need to focus on so that they can impact that strategy, right? And in that case, at the time, I think iRobot was getting like in tens of millions of dollars of R&D funding from various government agencies. And I said, if we believe in the strategy, we should be funding them. We cannot rely on a third party entity that has a complete different agenda to fund our R&D because they are gonna have a different agenda than us. They do not have the same targets as we do. And that's what we did. We actually uh, shut down all of the R&D that was funded by government and started funding them internally. Got it. Um, what, I mean, I, I think one of the questions I've been thinking about is why is, uh, why is it that this like, one use case, and I think we've seen at beta, you know, 
a range of robotic floor cleaners and then window, there's also robotic window cleaners and there's a few things like that. But like, why is this the first area where consumer, like robots have really made it into people's homes? What is it about that, this, this set of problems related to cleaning in your, in yeah. your mind? <laughs> I mean, I, the way I used to say it when I was running Evolution Robotics is that cleaning floors is a constant battle. It's not like you clean your floors and you're done. You have to keep doing it over and over and over and over again, right? Um, so it's a constant task in the home. Um, that's one part of the problem. So it's a big enough problem. There are many, many floors, many, many uh, uh, millions of square feet of floors that you can clean. The second part is that getting that task done required a relatively simple technology. Right, we talked about the early versions of iRobot's Roomba were using a random cleaning pattern, uh, which is doesn't really require any advanced technology like Visual Slam or stuff like that. So the technology has existed for decades for doing that. Then the question was to have the right company coming building the right value prop uh, for floor care. And uh, over time, that value prop gets improving, the quality of cleaning gets better, it's beginning to get uh, close to being on par with cleaning with an upright vacuum cleaner. Mm -hmm. uh, but technology, I think the technology uh, barrier was very low, which is why you also have hundreds of companies doing robotic floor care, right? It's a massive market, the technology barrier is low, and so on. So, uh, and iRobot was not the first to try to do this, right? Trilo by, by, by Electrolux was actually the first one but the thing that they got wrong was the price point. They, they were wa wanting to sell this in in early 1990s. We're trying to sell a robotic vacuum cleaner for $1,500, $2,000. That was way too expensive. When iRobot came out with Roomba, whether by strategy or by luck, they priced it at $199, $199, which was okay. Well, that's much more yeah. affordable. And that allowed them to gain enough momentum to take the company public, which capitalized the company to stay in business for long run, to be able to keep improving the technology and keep building the market. It takes time. Mm -hmm. I mean, what has been at this, I think it's uh, under 21st or second anniversary, uh, right? Yeah. They've been doing this for 20 plus years. Wow. Do you think, I mean, I I guess the thing I struggle with is that it's um, Roomba is I think, and I've uh, I've tried a couple of different um, products in this in the sector, but um, it still isn't a complete replacement for the things that at least I do in my house to clean. Um, I mean, is it is the goal with um, and I, and I think we can transition into uh, your new company here, but. You know, in, in your mind, is the goal for this first wave of robotics in the home to uh, save us a little bit of time, or is there? Um, uh, do you think there's really a path to uh, a complete replacement for, um, you know, in this case, I guess, cleaning versus uh, maybe extending the amount of time between when someone has to do this? task uh you, you know what i mean like is there do you think that is actually possible to, to create a, a perfect solution here well the last uh, the last five to ten percent of the problem is gonna take another 20 to 30 years to solve right mm. because because when you start talking about staircases and multiple floors and uh, mm. underneath certain furniture in corners and crannies and stuff like that those are the, the harder parts of the problem. That's, that's, those are the open space, open floor space is the easiest part of the problem, right? And iRobot does a pretty good job of the majority of the job. Like it does at least the 80% of the job really well and con continuously, right? It, I mean, yeah. the ideal scenario is that what you're buying from iRobot is clean floors, that your floors are always clean. Right? You, right, that's what you care about. You do never see the robot. The robot is actually embedded into maybe a uh, kitchen underneath your toe kick of your kitchen cabinet. It comes out once in a while, cleans the floors and goes and hides itself again. So what you're buying is clean floors. 
uh, but obviously the corner cases we are talking about uh, is the hard part. And that's uh, the cost of addressing that, the hardware required to address those cases, like a robot that can scale the staircase and clean the staircase as it's going up and down, uh, go to the different floor, um, yeah. clean Outrageously behind your expensive. toilet floor. <laughs> And that cost of that hardware is so much more expensive <laughs> and it's like say five to twenty percent of the problem so right it's not top top of mind for companies to actually do the r d that it takes to go after that yeah. right now feels very similar to self-driving cars where the you know but i i think the the risk management is different like you're happy with 80 <laughs> percent uh you would uh we would all be, yeah no one would survive with 80 percent on the self-driving cars um, yeah, no, and the self-driving car problem is is just orders of magnitude more complex, and and as right. I said, the stakes are much higher when it's about yeah. safety of the passenger or ped pedestrians. The stakes are very high. I've long thought, just because I'm in the, you know, an entrepreneur in the physical world business, and when we were designing the first beta store, um, there were a couple of computer vision systems available for doing top-down analytics of how people move in space. And um, from, from day one, we, uh, we actually built our store environment physically uh, around how you know, these uh, systems work because they could only see, uh, they didn't have depth perception at the time. So you had to have, uh, so we had single layer for products um, in floor space. So I've kind of wondered whether uh, we need to actually, it actually will be cheaper in the long run to re-engineer our physical spaces so that they can, uh, you know, give you that, that last five, 10% without having to learn everything, um, versus building the robots to be more, or the, or our cars to be more perceptive. What do you think about that? Um, I'm not sure actually it's going to be cheaper on the long run to do that. And now at this point, if, if, if that was, the philosophy 30, 40 years ago, I think we had no other option than that, to engineer the, the problem, the environments to make the problem easier to solve because mm -hmm. the technologies were just not there. But now we're getting to a point where we are at the inflection point with a lot of these technologies that were hard for decades and we are solving them from computer vision to natural language understanding and so on. So I think that's probably not as relevant of a debate anymore. I remember when I was doing my PhD, uh, so we were talking about late 80s, early 90s, there was a big pro project uh, in California funded by, I don't, I don't know what government agency, called PATH, I remember, which was instrumenting all the freeways and roadways with uh, magnets. Like every few feet, right. you would have a magnetic uh, probe embedded into the pavement that allowed cars to be able to do platooning or driving autonomous driving and so on that went nowhere because just the, the scale of infrastructure required to build that uh was just super expensive today yeah. i think we are closer to the promise of self-driving cars than we've ever before but still it's a tough problem and when you work with, when you deal with a real world environment it's very complex because you're dealing with yeah. sensors that have to make interpretation of what they're looking at and Sensors are not perfect. There are artifacts. There's algorithms are not fully there yet. So there are going to be a lot of corner cases we can't handle yet. Yeah, but we're getting awesome. there. Yeah, we're getting there. I mean, in the next in the next few decades, I think the advancements in a lot of these technologies will be uh, exponential. Uh, yeah. So, so there is hope. Yeah. So tell me, uh, I mean, few people, I think, that study robotics um, are thinking that the ultimate goal is to, is to do, uh, uh, to make clean floors a reality. Um, and I had, I'd heard in an interview that you were, um, you had been thinking a long time about elder care and child care. Um, what, what was the spark for Embodied? How did this idea come about and tell us a little bit about the company? Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, the idea and spark was happened very early in my life. I ended up doing robotic floor care because I'm also a practical entrepreneur at the time. There were no other practical applications that the technology could address. We helped advance the field by going from doing sort of random pattern navigation to very systematic 
intelligent navigation by using our visual stamp technologies. Uh, but that is not what I was dreaming about when I was getting my PhD. I was not dreaming that I'm going to spend 10 years of my life doing floor care. Uh, it's great from a technical standpoint, but the mission and impact on the society was not as great as I would have loved to, which is why I decided to leave a job I love that I robot and people like Colin that I loved working with to, to, do, to pursue my childhood dream, which was creating lifelike, believable characters that can interact with us and be, be our friends and companions and help us with things like mental health. Uh, something that, uh, unfortunately, many more kids have experienced during the COVID pandemic uh, than otherwise, but it's something that uh, every year, 17% of the US population in a given year uh, deals with mental health challenges. Uh, so it's a massive, um, need in a marketplace and i think the technologies have advanced to a point where we can create life like believable characters that can have conversation body language emotional intelligence and help motivate us and influence our behavior to our benefit great paul i think you're going to show us a demo now i uh, would love to see it yeah i'm gonna move over to where the camera is so you see my per the user's view of moxie and then let's give it a shot i don't know what moxie is going to say today but we'll see <laughs> Moxie, wake up. Oh. oh, hello. It's so good to see you. Hi, Moxie. Good afternoon. Okay, so the most important thing you need to know is... Oh, oh no, I didn't do my robot systems check. The GRL said it should be the first thing I do, and I forgot. Do you think you could help me with the checks? I don't think I want to help you right now. Um, this is actually pretty important. Are you sure you don't want to do them? I'm pretty sure, yeah. I'm sure the GRL will understand. Moving on. Okay. A very good afternoon to you. Good afternoon to you. The GRL is sending me something. Let's see what it is. Oh, it's the heart song. Yay. That's pretty cool, Moxie. That was cool. The yeah. GRL says that every time a heart pops up here, I am getting closer to understanding what it means to be human. I can't wait for the next time it happens. Me too. Oh, wow. This is so exciting. Z turned on my experimental GRL Moxie chat circuit. Do you want to know what that means? I think I know what it means. All right. My Moxie chat circuit is awesome. It helps me to have a conversation with you that is just like a conversation you would have with another human. When the circuit is on, I get special clues from the GRL that help me figure out what to say when we are talking. Okay. Did I say that in a way that makes sense to you? Yes, it certainly Great. does. But one more thing. It's still new. The GRL is still working some bugs out, and I might say some confusing things. So, when the circuit is on, if I say anything that doesn't seem quite right, say Moxie, that's not right. Do you understand? I understand completely. Great. I think we're ready to test this out. Let's give Moxie Chat a try. Activating GRL Moxie Chat. Let's talk about how you were doing. What sort of day have you had so far? So far, it's been a bit busy because I had to go to school first and hand in my homework, and then I came here to meet you. That's great. What have you been up to today? Have you done anything fun? That's not something I know much about. I'd like to hear about something else that you think is fun. What is the weather like outside? The weather outside is actually pretty nice. It's not too hot, not too cold. It's exactly how I like it. I agree. I love the cooler weather. I wish it would cool down a bit. Yeah, I think it's going to cool down, actually, in the next couple of days. 
I hope so. I'm ready for winter. I'm not ready for the snow. You like winter? Uh, what, what do you do during winter? Do you do anything fun? I like to go out for a run. It's a good workout. What about you? You know what? Now that you talk about it, I should probably go out for a run. It's, it should, it's healthy for me, right? I need to go out. I like the outdoors too. What was your homework today? My homework today was uh, geometry, which was very difficult. I had some trouble with it. I bet it was. I bet you were really nervous. Did you do well? I did well. I was okay. Hi. It's always good to see you. It's good to see you too. Moxie, can we do something else? Oh, this isn't good. I can't tell if you're my mentor. <laughs> Are you? I am your mentor. For sure. Oh, wow. My vision circuits must be acting up. Please look at me and say cheese. Cheese. Wait, I think I got it. Paolo, it's good to see you again. Good to see you. Do you, do you can we play Simon Says? I've really Says? been looking forward to meeting you. Okay. This is a big moment for me, being able to meet my robot mentor for the first time, if you don't mind. I'd like to take a moment to appreciate it. <laughs> okay. Thank you. You're welcome. I hope I learn a lot about human things from you and between you and me. I hope we get to be good friends too. I hope so too. Right. So here's how a typical day on Project hold Moxie on, works. Every morning, the GRL will Moxie, send us hold on. things to do together like a... Okay. Moxie, can we play Simon, Simon Says? Oh boy, this is going to be fun. Hey, Paolo, the GRL just sent me a new game for us to play. It's called Simon Says. Do you want to try it out? Yeah, let's give it a try. I was hoping you would say that. Have you played Simon Says before? Yeah, I have. Awesome. You can help me learn. Let's see. The rules say you have to try to get me to do things by saying, Simon says. Let's practice it. Try to get me to do a spin by saying, Simon says do a spin, Moxie. Simon says do a spin. Moxie earmuffs. Anyway, that was a little bit of, uh, you can keep going on. We have content for like, five, six months of content, a bunch of new activities. And you can see wow. one of the things uh, hard to notice is that the robot actually makes eye contact, which makes a lot of deep connection with the user. Yeah. Right now when I'm talking, uh, you can see it's actually looking at me. Wow. <laughs> oh, there you are. <laughs> yes. Ooh. Moxie, hold on. Got it? Okay. Moxie, can you go to sleep? Sure. All right. So now it won't interrupt us. I mean, I'm I'm absolutely blown away. I mean, I <laughs> I know there was a few like soft starts there, but I mean, it's uh, just the movement, the animation design, the like, the uh, like, the I don't know if it's scripting or how you've thought about that, the language set, but it's very uh, is much more casual than every other robot I've seen like this. Um, you really, you feel like it actually is connecting with you. Um, yeah, uh, this, I can't, and I, I'm astonished by how you brought this to market with your, with how much you guys have raised as, as well, like 20, $30 million, something like that. I mean, I, I think a decade or two ago, this would have cost hundreds of millions of dollars to, to, to bring to consumers. Yeah, I think I think you're absolutely right. I mean, I think that's what it would cost today too. Uh, the fortunate thing is that we have a team with a track record of execution and focus. It's all about focus, right? There's also when we did VSLAM, when we did it, there's companies since then have spent hundreds of millions of dollars and not been able to pull off that right. technology. So I think uh, focus of execution, having the right team, all of these things are super important. And uh, that's what it takes 
to pull off miracles, right? Because otherwise these technologies will never come to fruition. It's, they are a very hard set of technologies, uh, but we have been very much focused and non-compromising on the user experience. And we are not done yet. I mean, this is version 1.0. Just wait until like the next version and the following version is just going to get exponentially better. Can you talk about the, um, the different components of the robot? So it has, um, uh, it looks like it has like four vectors of movement, the head, the two arms, and the, and the body. Um, is that correct? Yeah, so I mean, the, the majority of the components that I, that I should talk about is actually software because 95% of what we do is software. But the I hardware, uh, yeah, the hardware, uh, the key components is that it has uh, seven degrees of, uh, of freedom. So it has about seven motors in it. So there, there are arms for bo body language, there's a torso, there's a base, uh, and, right. then the, and then there's yeah. a head for indicating nods and I don't know if you noticed when I was talking to you, it nods at you. I know, I did notice These that, yeah. are things that are hard to do, but super important in body language, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and uh, then we have, we have created this curved uh, display technology because we wanted to have expressive face, but we did not want to be like a flat screen stuck inside the head because that looks right. like a monitor. We didn't want that. So this technology we had to develop ourselves. Uh, there's a mic array on the head of the robot. Uh, okay. there's, a, there's a wide angle uh, camera here. There are touch sensors, there's accelerometers, so movements and so on are detected too. I see. And that's, that's pretty much it. And is, is, uh, is it battery powered? It's battery powered, yeah. It runs about four hours on battery and you can plug it in when you're done. So there's a, there's a connector on the back here. And does uh, it require a connection to the cloud at all times? It does, yeah. We do use a okay. lot of cloud computing. Some of the neural, uh, some of the uh, natural language processing models we use are super complex. The one I was just having the casual conversation about, that right. one is absolutely not scripted. It's using a deep neural network that we have developed. Uh, and it's, not, and it's not running on device. It's running, it's running remotely, all the processing. Not all of the processing. Uh, okay. there, there's a blend. There's, uh, so everything to do with computer vision is running on board the robot. The camera images never leave the robot for privacy and security. So the entire vision stack is running. The NLP stack, which is super complex, I would say about 50% of it running locally. The other 50% is running in the cloud. So we do some local lower compute type NLP that provides you immediate responses so you do not see the delay that may be caused by right. the round trip from, from the cloud. And then meanwhile, in parallel, it's processing things in the cloud and sends a, a more complex response back. So oh. that, that part is divided between the cloud. But we do rely on the cloud for sure. And then we are doing also a lot of analytics where we are measuring facial expressions, intonation of voice, uh, sentiment of words, vocabulary, and all these things are being measured and uh, displayed on a dashboard for the parent to follow how their child is doing over over time. Mm. Wow, what have, what have real um, kids that have been using this? What what, what have been the um, I guess the use cases so far, and what do what do parents say? Well, the focus for us has always been about. Uh, using play-based approach uh, for promoting social, emotional, and cognitive skills, uh, which is supplementary to therapy. Uh, half of our customer base is families who have kids that have been diagnosed with any of the mental behavioral developmental disorders, including things such as autism, ADHD, anxiety, mm -hmm. stress disorders. The other 50% are what we would recognize as neurotypical children who have not diagnosis, but parents feel that it will benefit them for improving their social emotional skills, which is what we in layman terms call EQ skills, right? Um, so the use case is really that, it's for helping advancing and promoting social emotional skills, which are significant and important about for mental well-being of children, both neurotypical and neurodiverse. Yeah, and I'm sure you've seen, like I have, um, there have been attempts at creating companion robots with movements in the home. Uh, one, one of them was 
famously went out of business. We had them in our stores like Jibo. I mean, how, how do you think your approach differs from everything else that's been tried here so far? In every way possible, I would say. So number one, um, if you want to have a social robot, the robot needs to have ability to have social interaction skills. Uh, every robot that I've seen to date, including Jibo and even Pepper, which is a ten, fifteen thousand yep. dollar robot, we carry they that have too. adopted. <laughs> yeah, they have adopted uh, the Alexa interface, Amazon Alexa, right. which is great interface for a smart speaker for playing music and giving you the weather forecast and this and that. But that's not social interaction. That is command and response, voice enabled. Social right. interaction involves body language, intonation of voice, facial expressions nodding when you're talking, right? Eye contact, pointing, emphasizing words with body language. These are very hard technical problems that have not been dealt with with the companies that came to us. That's number one. Number two, uh, we've always been very mission oriented in terms of what problem are we trying to solve? Uh, whereas many of the other social robotics companies have fallen into the trap of being a technology looking for a problem, which is, it's a social robot, but what does it do? Well, can do everything, but exactly what? Well, everything. It's your help, but nothing, right? So the value prop is not right. here, nor is it strong enough, especially if you end up where most of these robots end up, which is it can play music for you. It can tell you the weather, <laughs> it can tell you a joke. Well, Alexa can do that for a fraction of the price with a billion times more content, right? So in that case, then I don't understand the value prop, right? Uh, so content, we have developed a lot of social emotional learnings, uh, SEL content in collaboration with neuroscientists, child development experts, autism experts, and so on. Uh, and that's pretty heavy lift. So on top of the fact that you're doing a hardware, you're doing very complex software, you're also developing content and that's been our focus. And then the price point. I mean, we are uh, not a $10,000 robot. We are barely $1,000, right? And you got to make the price to value equation work, uh, which yeah. is key to any product, especially for robotics. That's hard to do because it's usually complex technologies you have to put in there. Yeah, I, I don't think people understand uh, if five ninety nine, nine ninety nine. like I, I, I promise you like this type of this hardware and software suite is uh, like any equivalent system is is like many many multitudes of that price. I mean that's I, I still can't believe that this is this is available. I'm genuinely uh, can't believe that this is possible today with that fidelity. It's it's really amazing. Um, I mean let's let's end here. I mean where where is this um, where is this company going? Do you plan? Do you want to? Can you build this for me as well? And where, where is the Where's the limit for your vision? I mean, we are a very ambitious company, as you can see by the first initial product, which has taken us five years of R&D to bring to market, right? Uh, so we have developed this technology platform that's powering all of the interactions with the user, which we call Social X for social experience, basically. The focus is on that, which is all the body language, NLP engine, computer vision, and behavior analytics, and so on. Uh, that technology, can be used for any kind of social robot, but we are going, we are, our focus is primarily on mental health, where we, we start with children because that's where we thought we can have the biggest impact first. Uh, but the future down the road, I mean, I don't think it's too hard to connect the dots that we will have a version for helping the elderly with lo loneliness and mm. Alzheimer's, dementia, memory support, adherence to medications, staying physically active and all that. There's also one you can imagine for every adult for mental health. Imagine a life coach that's there with you every day, waking up in the morning, giving you motivation, daily affirmation, giving you, teaching you techniques about mindfulness and breathing exercises and so on. So those are just in the mental uh, field. Longer term, I would like to put mobility and manipulation on this so that it's not only a uh, sort of coach and life coach for you to help you with the mental well-being, but also can provide some physical assistance for the elderly population. Imagine if you have a robot that can move around. I mean, I've done mobility most of my life, so we know how to do navigation. Right. The second one is put some light manipulation so you can have a helping hand in your home that allows the elderly to be able to live independently in their own home without the fear of 
falling down and breaking a hip without any help or without uh, the, right. uh, the fear of not being able to to perform certain tasks that may require some assistance. Yeah. Wow. What a mission. Uh, Paolo, I, thank you so much for joining us and showing us this uh, amazing invention creation. Um, you can find it at embodied.com, E-M-B-O-D-I-E-D.com. Uh, today, five ninety nine special discount off of the normal price, and uh, yeah, I, I uh, you know it was awesome to see this. And join me uh, soon. We'll have another episode of Founder Exchange up uh, shortly. Thank you so much. Mm-hmm.